for joining me. We are in 1 Kings chapter 13. Let's jump right in. This one's going to get weird. You know sometimes you're like, is that actually in the Bible? This is one of those chapters. So 1 Kings 13, we're still talking about the life of Jeroboam, who is the king of Israel. That's the northern kingdom, the ten tribes of Israel. We'll get back to Rehoboam, the king of Judah, and the southern kingdom in this next chapter. But uh, as we mentioned, we're studying uh, this action-packed section of scripture uh, where the kings we're going to meet did some really remarkable things and some horrible, terrible things. And the prophets that we're going to study are these fearless spokesmen of God. Uh, we'll see oftentimes they're not as fearless as we'd like to imagine. Uh, but these spokesmen for God, in any case, stand up and stare down kings uh, with the word from the Lord. And today's story is a great example of that. And it ends with a really rough low, but we'll get to that. We find Jeroboam standing at the altar. You may remember this imagery because in chapter 8, Solomon stood at the altar of the temple as he prayed and dedicated the temple. Now, this is a false god and a false temple, and so Jeroboam doesn't get to speech because this temple has no legitimacy. But God has offered Jeroboam a kingdom if he would obey, but God never offered Jeroboam a temple at any point in the conversation. And so we have this unnamed prophet who comes to confront King Jeroboam, and he delivers this message with such directness that challenges Jeroboam so, like, in his face that Jeroboam immediately points to him and says, you got to arrest that guy. And we have to assume that if they had actually carried out this whole order, that this prophet would have paid with his life. And Jeroboam's deliberate defiance of the true worship of God was an affront to God that he didn't leave unchallenged. And so this prophecy that we are going to read about, one prophet has called it one of the most remarkable prophecies in scripture is there's a prophet of the line of David that he calls by name Josiah, who's going to actually show up 300 years later, and he's going to actually work to undo all this cultic worship that Jeroboam had actually established in defiance of God. And so it, it it's interesting. We don't know a lot about this prophet, but we know he's from the south, so he didn't come from the territory of Israel, not from Jeroboam's idolatrous kingdom, but from Judah, where God is still worshipped in Jerusalem, uh, at least to some level, and they're still uh, honoring his commandments, at least to some degree. And 200 years after um, this prophet, we'll find the prophet Amos, who's going to come back to Bethel and declare God's judgment on the nor whole northern kingdom. But it's interesting, um, because this prophet comes, and Jeroboam says to arrest him, and when we follow the life of prophets, so often we see um, that they get assigned to verify their, their message. And it's usually like, hey, if this thing happens immediately, this thing in the future that I prophesied will 100% come to pass. And so this prophet uh, is given such a sign, because uh, Jeroboam is uh, worshiping an illegitimate altar, altar there in Bethel. The altar actually splits apart in front of their eyes, and it says that uh, the ashes poured out of the altar, which is an interesting detail. Again, the details matter here, because if you know anything about how you're supposed to do worship in the temple of God, Leviticus 6.10 says, after burnt offerings, the ashes are meant to be removed by priests who go through several layers of clothing to not be unclean. Jeroboam's knockoff worship literally just has an altar where they burn things. It's the surface level symbols that don't obey God's actual word. We talked about that in, uh, in our last chapter. But God gave Jeroboam not just this, but a personal object lesson uh, by making his outstretched hand shrivel up. And that will get the attention of anybody. And, and so the altar's broken, your hand's shriveled, the message is clear. Jeroboam, you are not in control of anything. It doesn't matter that you're the king. King of what? Shriveled hands and broken altars? Shut up. And, and so with his own health at stake, Jeroboam suddenly reduced from this raging king to like a wimpening petitioner. And he called uh, the prophet, you know, the Lord your God, which is, again, a giveaway to the attitude of his heart, even though he was from Israel, even though he should know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord is the God of this prophet, not the God of Jeroboam. And so uh, this knockoff version of God that he worships at Dan and Bethel is not that God. And so in spite of all this, God chooses to answer the prophet's prayer and actually heals Jeroboam's hand. And now comes some more confusingness into this whole situation. So... Jeroboam uh, offers the prophet a reward. Come back to my palace, come eat with me. Um, he's also basically saying, if you're in my house, you're under my protection. Nobody will touch you. You have the royal stamp of approval in my kingdom. And so uh, it cuts both ways because it's also a good way for Jeroboam to say, look, the prophet came to my house and he ate with me. Look, I'm still approved by the man of God, right? I'm still prophetically approved king. Not like Rehoboam in the south. You know how those idolaters are. And uh, luckily, 
Uh, the old saying kind of holds true. The God's prophet was there for business and not pleasure. He wasn't making a social call. Uh, and Jeroboam, unfortunately, had shown that he had no regard for God's purity of worship that required obedience. This prophet was supposed to be his foil. It was supposed to be one who would be observing God's rule. And so this obedience required that the prophet turn down the chance for dinner with the king and the reward from the royal treasury. God had spoken to this guy. You see, Jeroboam never got the picture, spiritually speaking. At least we learned earlier, when God came face to face with Jeroboam and made some incredible promises to him, evidently Jeroboam did not consider God's promises worth the necessary obedience on his part. He looked the other way, plunged the, the northern kingdom into idolatry and false worship that they'd cling to for several centuries. So since Jeroboam had rejected God's goodness, God confronted the king with his prophet and the true uh, judgment that would come. But even after this, it says Jeroboam did not change his evil ways in 1333. He rejected God's word and warning. All that was left was for the sentence of judgment to be carried out because he did not obey. And so we'll see kind of in a reversal of the Passover story that judgment is going to fall on Jeroboam's son, Abijah. Uh, and that's for next chapter. But the story now breaks away from Jeroboam and confronts this unnamed prophet. Um, because obedience, again, is the message here. And God had given this prophet really clear instructions to obey. In fact, the prophet is able to repeat these instructions to Jeroboam in verse 9. He says this, For the Lord gave me this command, You must not eat or drink anything while you are there, and do not return to Judah by the same way you came. So there's a lot of wordplay on this phrase, return by the same way, which is essentially amounts to re returning to death, which we're going to see play out. And so while he's in Bethel, this prophet, he obeys God. He refuses, you know, dinner with the king and he goes back his own way. But while in Bethel, our unnamed prophet meets a false old prophet who convinces our godly prophet that he has a brand new word from the Lord. And his new word supersedes what our first prophet had been told. And it's it's so hard to even call someone when he calls them old prophets. Like, well, maybe he used to be a prophet. Maybe he used to hear from God. Maybe he used to speak for the Lord. But here in Bethel, that time has long passed. And instead of encouraging this prophet from Judah to obey the Lord, he lies and convinces the prophet to abandon God's word that he knew to be true and come eat with him. You see, false prophets, they speak from their imagination and they often contradict God's word. But true prophets speak for God, and false prophets always bring judgment. And in a sad irony, this old prophet actually sits and he receives a true word from the Lord. God actually used this prophet one more time to speak truth after he lied and spoke and convinced this prophet to come to his house. And God tells our unnamed prophet that he's disobeyed me. You know, you've disobeyed me. You went and you ate while you were there. You weren't supposed to do that. And so what is the message of Kings? This whole book, right? Obedience is blessing and disobedience, destruction. And so our old false prophet tells this new prophet, you aren't going to make it home. And in this really strange scene, uh, our unnamed prophet meets a lion on the road. The lion kills him. The lion just stands over his body and a donkey uh, didn't run off, and so you have this lion who doesn't eat the prophet or eat the donkey, and the donkey doesn't run from the lion, and these people walk by, and they're just like, and the lion's just standing there. The whole point is, is to be unsettling. It's meant to be, this is divine. This is not the natural order. The lion is not killing to eat. It's not eating this, it just mauled a guy and not eating him. The lion's not eating the donkey that's still just sitting there tied up hee-hawing. The lion's standing there and watching people walk by, taking in this scene. It's dark. It's really dark. The point, though, is forcefully made. The prophet should have followed the command he received. The command the Lord your God gave you, verse 21 says, rather than being led off the path by another prophetic claim. And I might step on a few toes with this, but maybe God doesn't want you to go sit down and have a nice meal and be happy and healthy and wealthy and prosperous. Maybe his word to you is obey. And... It's one of those things you always need to test anything a prophet tells you against the word of God again, because false prophets make it up. If it contradicts the word of God, it's obviously not from God. And so a great way to see if a word is from God is can it be preached anywhere? If somebody says this is from God, make sure it actually fits 
with God's divine plan, right? We, it's so easy in America, in Western countries. God wants you to be rich and, and wealthy and wise, and he wants you to, you know, a sign of God's blessing is to be materially blessed, and that preaches really well in the Western world. I mean, there are whole preachers who built their, their empires on it. But God wants you to obey, that preaches everywhere. You can go to Africa where they're never going to be blessed and they're or, or, or wealthy in that term of blessing. They're never going to have riches beyond their wildest dreams, but they can obey the God of the universe. The word of the Lord is always to his people at all times, at all places. Don't be suckered in by a false prophecy because you want a meal and some company and you find it appealing. The first word of God always, ever, is a call to obey. Jeroboam didn't get that message. And, and so it's crystal clear from this account that God's law stands over everyone, even prophets, ministers, people of God, clergy, cloth. We're just people. Just because you have the name Revan doesn't mean anything, right? You can get that online for like 24 bucks. It's way cheaper than the student debt I got into. But it doesn't matter if you think you're a man of God or not because God's law stands over everyone equally. No one is exempt from it. Even prophets must obey it or face judgment. And to wrap a little bow on this, God can even use false prophets to occasionally speak the truth. Because once again, what's the story? God is in control. And God will do what he wants, when he wants, with who he wants. Which is a cool setup for how Elijah will burst on the scene in a couple of chapters. But true prophecy is always going to bring forth judgment that it promises. And even prophets can't escape that judgment. So our chapter <clears throat> then jumps back in to check back in with Jeroboam who hears what happens to this man of God who he had met, who he had seen. This man had cracked the altar that he had built in front of him. This man had withered and restored his hand. And verse 33 wraps it up this way. But even after this, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil ways. He continued to choose priests from the common people. He appointed anyone who wanted to become a priest for the pagan shrines. This became a great sin and resulted in the utter destruction of Jeroboam's dynasty from the face of the earth. So this persistent idolatry, as it always does, leads to disaster. And his attempt to secure his house by making false houses for false gods at Bethel, Dan, and throughout Israel, because of that, Israel will fall. Because God is in control. He will do what he promised. And what he promised was judgment. Not a happy chapter. The next couple will be a little rough. But don't worry, as always... When it seems like God is out of control, he's usually setting something up. And we'll see that in the coming chapters. Let's pray today. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for strange things. Thank you, God, that you reveal yourself in ways that we would never think or ask or imagine. Your ways are higher than our ways. And so we just take the, you at your word. And God, we understand that obedience is important. And so, God, we just pray that you would help us to obey your word. God, we are educated beyond our level of obedience here in the Western world. And so just help us, God, to understand that we are beholden to your laws and, and your calling and your mission. And just to, um, God, just be willing, even when sometimes it doesn't make sense. Why would you say that? Why would you do that, God? Help us to not, um, help us to not be stuck with the question of it, but only to fitly adore and obey you. And so, God, I pray you would just work in our hearts. Forgive us when we run after things that sound more comfortable or um, convenient or compelling, things that, God, we want to be true that contradict your word. God, give us just discernment. God, like Solomon, we pray for wisdom to follow you well. And so, God, unlike Solomon, help us to keep our heart focused on you and undivided. So bless us. Give us strength and courage to obey when it's, it's difficult. And, God, because of that, may we see your blessings and may we see your word go out of our lives and change the lives of those around us for, God, our good and your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, thank you so much for joining me. Make sure that you leave a comment, questions, thoughts, concerns. Just say, hey, isn't that weird? Where'd that line come from? Whatever. Interact a little bit. Thank you for joining me on this journey. And we'll see you next time for chapter 14. God bless you.